you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open with me to Luke chapter 4. And if you're just joining us, over the past few weeks, we've begun this series as we're going to be walking through it together as a church throughout the entire gospel of Luke. And if you were here last week, Pastor Jeremy, he left off when Jesus was about 12 years old and he was being about his father's business in the temple. And then when we get to chapter 3, it fast forwards about 18 years. And I'm going to recap chapter 3 for us really quick, but we're going to spend the majority of our time here in chapter 4. But once we get to chapter 3, um, that's when we first meet John the Baptist. And he's a guy who had this incredible ministry where um, some scholars believe he was baptizing thousands of people at a time in the Jordan River. Which is crazy because John, to us, by our standards, would have seemed like a complete whack job, okay? John, he was, he was living out in the wilderness. He made his own clothes from camel hair, and his diet consisted of bugs and wild honey. But he was a prophet, and throughout the centuries, God would speak to his people through the prophets in order to lead them to repentance. However, most of the time, more often than not, the people would disregard the prophets, and they ended up killing most of them. But at this point, it had been at 400 years since the last time a legitimate prophet had risen up among the people of Israel. And there was a lot of nostalgia surrounding John here, that the people were really drawn to. His setting, his message, the way he carried himself, it was very reminiscent of the prophet Elijah, who was one of the most famous prophets of all time. And also, John seemed to be very countercultural. Contrary to the society he was living in, it was like John refused to dress the way everyone else dressed or live the way everyone else lived or eat the way everyone else ate. He seemed to be very anti-societal, which the people could get behind because they didn't like the society that they were living in. Why? Because they were ruled by the Roman Empire. The Jewish people hated the fact that they were ruled by a foreign people because in their minds, they were God's chosen people, they were the superior race, and they should be the leading world power. So this is something John was doing that they could get behind. However, John wasn't taking a political stance or making any political statements. He wasn't taking a stand against the Roman Empire. He was preparing the people for something so much more important. John's job was to stir up a very complacent people of God in order to prepare their hearts for where their Savior would publicly arrive on the scene. The prophet Isaiah prophesied about John 700 years earlier. And in Matthew's account, he writes, For this is he, John, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And even further than that, the setting that John was ministering in was very significant because if you think back to our series in Exodus we came out of recently, whenever the people of Israel were delivered from Egypt, what did they do? They wandered around the wilderness before they crossed the Jordan River to enter into the promised land. But now John is back in the wilderness, baptizing people in that same Jordan River, preparing them for the promised Messiah. John was letting them know it was time for a new Exodus a greater exodus that all the Old Testament prophets and scriptures were pointing towards and waiting for for generations. And now, one of the reasons why I know John wasn't just some crazy cult leader at this time is because he wasn't calling people to leave society and to leave their families and to leave their homes and come out there in the wilderness with him and start some sort of weird commune. Okay? He wasn't calling the people he, to come and follow him. He was actually sending people back into society, back into their jobs, back into their lives. He was saying, take this repentance and take this baptism and allow it to transform the way you live right where you are. And we see in chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, we see John give these new repentant believers three principles to practice in their new walk with God. And these are, one, be generous, two, be honest, and three, be content. Now, we're not going to break those down further because we did that in our I Was But Now series from last year, which you can go back to and watch if you want to get more context on John chapter 3, if you so desire. But these three practical life lessons are important for us because a genuine relationship with God brings you to a point where you realize he is everything that you need. But the enemy will tell you, as we'll see here in a moment, that You need to look out for yourself first. You don't need to be generous. You don't need to be honest. You need to make sure you're taken care of before anything else. The enemy will tell you you need more 
You don't need to be content with what you have. No, you need more physically. You need more monetarily. You need more reputationally. The enemy wants you to have a constant thirst for the things that will never satisfy. And Jesus shows us in chapter 4 how we can combat these lies. Before we get there, to close out chapter 3, John, we see him baptizing multitudes of people. And we see towards the end of the chapter that one day Jesus himself comes to be baptized. Showing the example for us that even he, God in flesh, would also follow through in obedience to believers' baptism. And it's this beautiful moment where the heavens open up, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. The Father speaks audibly from heaven. He says, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. And then to close out the chapter, we see the genealogy of Jesus leading all the way back to Adam, which is significant because where we pick up in chapter 4, we see that Jesus is going to pick up right where Adam left off. Jesus is the true and better Adam because where Adam failed, Jesus was going to succeed in order to begin his journey for our redemption. So if you're with me here in Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. You know, it's very interesting that the attack that Jesus is going to endure from Satan is coming directly after the most spiritual moment of his life up to this point. Right after he was baptized, had this incredible experience as the heavens open up, immediately the enemy attacks. Maybe you've experienced this before. Maybe you've been recently baptized or you experienced some sort of spiritual breakthrough and you feel like you're progressing more in your faith than you ever have, but then at the same time, some things seem to be getting harder. Things aren't seeming to fall into place the way they should. Temptation seems to get even stronger, and you start to wonder if even this whole life with Jesus is really worth it because it's seemingly getting even more difficult with him, which is exactly the entire point of the attack that gets you thinking that way. Don't be surprised whenever the enemy comes quickly to try to knock you off course whenever you start growing in your faith. Because more often than not, obedience to God will be followed by oppression from the enemy. But whenever we experience those attacks, we can be encouraged that we're on the right track. And the enemy's doing something because we got them worried. And you can take heart because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Now, Before we go any further into this passage, let me clarify a couple of things. In Matthew's account, he intentionally states that Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted. So it seems that Jesus was intentionally putting himself in a situation to experience temptation. Why? Well, first for us. Hebrews 4, 5 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So yes, Jesus wants to give us an example of how we can combat the direct attacks of enemy and temptation in our lives, but even more so, he wants us to know that he's been there. Now, believe it or not, there is no struggle or temptation that you've dealt with or ever experienced that he does not understand. That's what makes him such a good God. That's why Isaiah can confidently call him a wonderful counselor, because he can be there for you now because he's been there before. And now the main thing that I want to clarify is that Jesus puts himself in a situation intentionally to be tempted. We should not do that. Why? Because we are not Jesus. We are not God in flesh. We do not intentionally fight temptation. We intentionally flee temptation. That should be our first default response, to get as far away as quickly as possible. We need to be like Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Just leave the jacket there and hightail it out of there as quick as we can. And we will not be able to avoid temptation completely in our lives. We will still face temptation every single day. But as Paul tells us, we do not fight it, we flee it. He says in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. And then he says this in, in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 13. He says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure. Now, this is encouraging first because it lets you know that you're not alone. 
The enemy wants you to think that the struggles and the temptations you have are specific to you and other people won't understand. But that's a lie because no temptation is overtaking you that's not common to man. You are not alone. And how do you endure that temptation? Not by fighting it, but we what? It's highlighted. Escape it. We don't fight it. We escape it. Now, this is the verse where most people get that famous saying, God will never give you more than you can handle, which is complete and utter nonsense, okay? If God never gave us more than we could handle, why would we need him? He gave you life. This life is more than you can handle, and temptation is more than you can handle as well. That's why he provides a way of escape. So instead of fighting it, you can run into his loving and protecting arms. And how do we know that he can protect us? Because we see it here in our passage that he can handle everything that we can't. And now the last thing that I want to clarify before we get further into this passage is that I'm going to identify three different tactics of the enemy. And when identifying those tactics, I'm going to refer to them as the enemy and not Satan himself. Why? Because I don't want to give Satan more credit than he deserves. Satan is not omnipresent like our God is. He cannot be in more than one place at one time. And I don't think that I have ever been personally attacked or tempted by Satan himself because I think he's got much bigger fish to fry in the world than Kenny Hall. However, there are demonic forces and influences that operate under his command. And we get a bit of insight into their operation in Daniel chapter 10, which you can study on your own time if you want. And if you don't believe me that hell, Satan, that demonic forces exist, well, you're wrong, and you're calling Jesus a liar, and they have you right where they want you. Because one of the number one tactics of the enemy is try to operate in secret and make you think that they're either non-existent or at least not involved in your life. And now, I'm not one to over-spiritualize these things and blame every little thing that goes wrong on the attack from the enemy, Okay, I don't think spilling coffee on myself on the way to church is the enemy, is Satan trying to get in my head and try to throw me off my game or anything like that. Sometimes I just do stupid things. Okay? Sometimes I get sick because I didn't take care of myself and it wasn't some supernatural attack. However, I do believe that Jesus identifies three different tactics of the enemy that we need to be prepared for and on guard for whenever they come. So Jesus, he's been out in the wilderness fasting for 40 days. We pick up at the end of verse 2 and says, And when they were ended, he was hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Here we see the first tactic of the enemy, and that is the enemy likes to attack identity. He says first, If you are the Son of God, as if Jesus needed to question who he was, where he'd come from, or where he had come from. And it's not really that Satan is questioning his identity, because that, that word if can actually be translated as since, and since you are the Son of God. You see, what he's really wanting to do is get him to question God's identity and God's character. If you really are the Son of God, why would he let you go hungry? No, just turn these into stone. So the enemy would love to get us to question not only our identity, but even more so, they would love us to question the identity of God himself. We see that in the very first temptation. The serpent goes to Eve in the garden and says, did God really say that you shouldn't eat of any of the fruit? You see, if the enemy can get us to question God's word, then get us to question his character and his heart towards us. He says, no, if you eat the fruit, no, 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 you won't surely die. No, you'll just know the difference between the knowledge of good and evil, and you'll be more like him. That's all it's going to do. Now, was that a lie? Not really. Because when they ate the fruit, they wouldn't die instantly there on the spot. You know, they would eventually die, but not then just by taking a bite. And it would open them up to know the knowledge between good and evil, and they would be more like God in that respect. So, He wasn't really lying, but what makes it so diabolical is the fact that it was a manipulated truth. He took something that God was protecting them from and made it seem appealing to them, and it led to their downfall. What the enemy wants to do is subtly turn our attention towards what we think we want and keep our focus off of the one who knows best. And we see that in our culture today, do we not? 
How many times do we hear, even in church culture, how many times do we hear, did God really say? Did God really say you shouldn't have sex before marriage? Did God really say that marriage should only be between a man and a woman? Did God really say that you were fearfully and wonderfully made? Did God really say that going to church is really all that important? Did God really say that you are a new creation? That you, after all you've done, could be forgiven? Did God really say he wants a relationship with you? Now, if you have been wrestling or struggling with any of those questions just referenced, I put those questions in the HTC mobile app. So if you have the app and you're following along with the Shelby Sermon Notes, you can see all those questions with scripture references next to each of them that you can do some more digging and studying and see exactly what God says about those things. But the enemy loves to get us asking questions like that, posing the questions like that, questioning God's word. And once he gets his question in God's word just slightly, then the enemy can begin to operate in those manipulated truths. Can you really have a relationship with a God you can't see or touch or feel? Isaiah says that his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Can you really have a relationship with someone like that? They'd never understand you. Oh, make no mistake, the enemy will quote scripture too. We'll see that later as well. And they love to twist Scripture just enough. Get this. Don't miss this. The enemy loves to twist Scripture just enough to get you to form your own opinion on it. The enemy loves to hear us say, well, this verse says that, but I think it really means this. So the enemy can get us questioning God's word just enough so we'll slowly begin to question him entirely and get us to compromise more and more and more. And that is precisely the reason why the majority of people on this planet today are living in a complete identity crisis. Because we will never know who we really are until we know who our creator truly is. And that's exactly why Jesus quotes the scripture that he does. Every temptation that comes his way, he has a direct response from scripture for it. And in this particular temptation, he quotes from Deuteronomy 8.3, which says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus is letting us know that what is going to sustain us and strengthen us more than anything else in this life is God's word. God's promises, what he says, not what I think or feel. And I cannot stress this enough. My opinions and my worldview mean nothing. I don't want to base my life around my opinions and how I think and how I feel things should be. I want to base it all solely on his word. I want to get to the point in my life where I stop saying so much, well, well, I think. And I want to start saying more, well, he says. And this is so hard for so many Christians because if we're honest with ourselves, we don't really know his word that well. I'm telling you, you can hear a sermon every single Sunday for the rest of your life, but if that is the extent of your intake of God's word, you will be completely unprepared and the enemy will eat you alive. That's why Peter says, our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he devours those who do not know God's word and therefore directly do not know who they are in him. And if you're a believer in this room, If it's struggling with your identity in Christ, not really sure what your identity in Christ looks like, I encourage you, read Romans chapter 8 at least once a day for an entire week. Because Romans chapter 8 will tell you exactly who you are when these lies start coming up. When the enemy tries to beat you over the head with your past mistakes or current struggles, you can remind yourself and the enemy that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. When the enemy tries to make you question if you can even live for God at all, you can proclaim that the same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead now lives inside of you. When the enemy tries to manipulate the truth and start to get you thinking that you can't have a real relationship with God, you can confidently say that you have been adopted as his child. The spirit of God is in you. Because you have the spirit of God, you can cry out, Abba, Father, to him. That's how close of a relationship he has with you. When the enemy tries to get you to believe that God is absent, and if he was good, he wouldn't let bad things happen to you, you can stand in the truth that God works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
And then when the enemy keeps attacking, keep trying to weaken your faith, you can let them know out loud that you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you, and their attacks are only going to make you stronger. And when the enemy tries to get you to question his love for you, you can get to preaching that neither death nor life nor angel or demon or absolutely nothing in or out of this world can ever separate you from the love of God. Know it, repeat it, believe it. That's who you are. And there is nothing the enemy can do about it except get you to question it. Even Satan himself actually has no power or authority over you. In John 8, 44, Jesus refers to the devil as the father of lies. And you know, the only power that a liar has is getting someone to believe a lie. That's why the truth sets you free. And that's why you need more of his word and his truth and his promises in your life and less of other people's opinions. And even when we are prepared with the truth, the enemy's still going to come back. You know, the scripture, the Bible isn't some sort of devil repellent, but the proper use of scripture will counter the evil influence when the enemy comes spewing more lies. And we see him come back in verse 5. He says, and the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I'll give all this authority in their glory, for it's been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will just worship me, it'll all be yours. And Jesus answered him, and it said, you shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. This time, our next tactic, we see the enemy appeals to prosperity. No, it's actually a lie from hell that tells you if you'll just come to a relationship with God, he'll make you instantly rich and successful. How do I know that? Because first off, it's completely unscriptural. It's a manipulated truth. And also because it taints our worship. If we come into a relationship with God expecting him to give us all of these things, well, then we're not going to be worshiping him. We're going to be worshiping what we think he's going to give us. But our worship is supposed to bring us to a deeper understanding of who he is, how great he is, and how everything that we are desiring and looking for in this life is actually found in him. So what the enemy wants to do is make us think that what we're actually desiring and looking for is more money, a better job, a nicer car, a better family, power, prominence, success. But what we're actually looking for in this life is purpose, belonging meaning, significance, direction, and all of that I firmly believe is only found in your identity in Christ. That's why we worship him alone, to get to know his word, get to know his promises. But if the enemy can make us think that those things that we're looking for are found in temporary stuff, well, then they can leave us in constant want rather than allowing us to find contentment. There's a reason why John the Baptist told those new believers in John chapter 3 to be content with what they had. And now, to be clear, money, success, position, good reputation, relationships, even cars, boats, and houses, these are not bad things. These are good things. They are blessings from God, and God is actually pleased whenever we enjoy such things. But what the enemy wants to do is take something that's good, and inflame our imagination in such a way that we will love them so much we'll do anything we can to get them with or without God. The enemy loves to take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, all in order to misdirect our worship. Now, it's interesting that when Satan takes Jesus up and he shows him all of the kingdoms in the world in a moment, he shows them all of the splendor and all the glory, and Satan says, All of this is mine. It's been delivered to me. Jesus doesn't say, nah, uh No, it's mine. No, mine. (laughs) Jesus doesn't argue with them at all. Because it actually was. Ever since the fall, Satan had taken dominion over the earth. And he's referred to in scripture as the prince of the power of the air. The ruler of this present world. But Satan knew why Jesus was there. He was there to take it back. So Satan, what he was wanting to do was try to manipulate the process. And he doesn't leave, but just worship me and I'll give you these things. No, first he takes them up. He shows him all the splendor, shows him all of the glory, tries to appeal to his heart, shows him all of the people and all of the nations that he came for because the Father loved them so much. 
And Satan says, hey, you see all this? If you just worship me, could be translated, just kiss the ring, pay homage to me, give me some credit, I'll just give it all to you right now. And I'll just fade away and you'll never hear from me again. What's Satan trying to do? He's trying to manipulate the process by trying to get Jesus to bypass the cross. And we see that further whenever we pick up in verse 9. It says, And then Satan took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, go ahead, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, many Pharisaical scholars, they were convinced that whenever the Messiah would show up in Jerusalem, he would appear on the pinnacle or the roof of the temple. He would just appear there. It came from a misinterpreted prophecy in Malachi. So Satan proposes that they make a show of it. Give the people what they want, Jesus. You can just show up on the roof. You'll have everyone's attention. And then you can just coolly and calmly walk up to the side. No one's going to know what the heck is going on. And then you can just slowly step off. Everyone will gasp. You'll be falling full speed to the ground. But then, because the Father loves you so much... And he doesn't want you to get hurt. No, no, no. He'll, he'll send his angels to come and catch you like it says in Psalm 91, remember? And then you'll just float slowly to the ground and the crowds will go nuts. They're going to love you, Jesus, and they'll instantly accept you as their Messiah. And here we see the final tactic of the enemy, and that is the enemy offers, quote, unquote, the easy way out. See, the enemy is all about instant gratification. Again, they love to take a good thing, manipulate the plan and process for it so that it will become a destructive thing. Is that not what they've done with sex? They took a beautiful, God-ordained thing, manipulated the plan and process for it, took it out of God's ordained context, and made it all about instant gratification. And therefore, the focus of it becomes solely selfish, self-gratifying, And as a result, we have more abortions, more broken homes, more single mothers, more fatherless children. The list can go on and on and on, because all because the enemy made waiting a four-letter word. Oh, the enemy loves to preach the gospel of self. Why should you wait? Why should you deny how you feel? You should, you should deserve, you deserve to have what you want, when you want it, in the most comfortable way for you. And don't let anyone tell you any different. Don't let anyone else get in your way, but I'll tell you, Jesus has a different perspective. He says, take up your cross daily. He says, the greatest person is the one who serves others best. He says to count others more significant than yourself. You see, Jesus, he never taught to find yourself. He taught to die to yourself. He never said, follow your heart. He said to follow him. He never said, oh, you just do you. He said, no, love one another just as I have loved you. And in this passage, we see the complete contrast of the two warring principles in the spiritual realm. Satan, he keeps trying to get Jesus to use his power and his position as the son of God to try to benefit himself. But Jesus never once in his entire life and ministry ever used his power and divinity for his own benefit. It was only ever for the benefit of others. These are the two warring principles. It's Satan's way is based on the principle, your life poured out for me. But Jesus' way is based on the principle, my life poured out for you. Make no mistake, Jesus poured his life out for you and for me. Because you see, Jesus, he didn't just come merely as our example of how to live a better life. If Jesus is just our example, that's discouraging. So I don't know about you, what, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I can't do what Jesus would do. I'm not God in flesh. You're not gonna catch me walking on water or, or feeding 5,000 people with a few scraps. I can't do what Jesus would do. 
I can't look Satan and temptation in the face and be tempted in every possible way and yet still be without sin. I can't do that. I've already failed at that so many times. But Jesus isn't just an example. He came to pass the test that I couldn't pass. He came to live the life that I couldn't live. And he came to die the death that I deserve to die because he's not just my example. He's more importantly and he's primarily my savior. Satan came to Jesus proposing that he use his divinity to ease the path for himself. Just live a good and comfortable life. You can still be the Messiah and teach them all how to live good lives. But Satan knew if that was the extent of it, we would remain hopeless. Now Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to pay the price for our sins. Without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sins. He had to do it to bridge the gap between us and God that sin had created. And he couldn't take the easy way out. Even though everything within him wanted to. Even when he was in the garden sweating drops of blood before his arrest, begging the Father, Father to take this cup from him. Nothing within him felt like it or wanted to go through the most excruciating pain and torture that we could ever imagine. But he had to go through the cross for us. Pastor Tim Keller, he breaks it down this way. He says, Jesus came primarily to die, not primarily to live. If Jesus came primarily to live, he would merely be an example. And therefore, we would find our way to God by just trying to live more like Jesus. But if Jesus came primarily to die, he doesn't come just as an example. He comes primarily as a savior. If he came merely as an example, he would be like any other founder of any other religion teaching, this is the way to God. But Jesus says, I'm God, come to find you. And that's exactly what separates the gospel, the Bible, the message of Jesus from every other religion on the planet. Because every other religion will tell you all the things you need to do in order to try and get closer to God. But the message of Jesus is there's nothing you could ever do to get to God. So he came to you. And that's exactly what the enemy will try to get you to question for the rest of your life. They'll try to make you believe that you need to work hard for his approval. You need to be good enough for him. You're not doing enough. You need to do more, but that's a lie. He loves you. How do I know he loves you? Because he came for you. And he already accomplished everything that was ever needed and required for God's acceptance. And there's nothing you could ever do to earn it. And there's nothing you can do to lose it once you've received it. And things will get difficult. Things will get messy. Temptation is just around the corner. And if Jesus had to go to the cross before he could take up his throne, we shouldn't expect there to be an easy road for us either. Because Jesus promised in this world you will have trouble. But praise God he didn't stop there, did he? Yes, He promised that there would be trouble, but he also said, take heart. Why? For he has overcome the world. I'm going to ask the band if they could go ahead and come back up as we close in a time of worship. But you know, a movement of God will never happen without a fight. So as you grow in your faith, expect you will experience spiritual attacks in this world. In verse 13, uh, to close out our passage, says, When the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. He wasn't done. He was still going to come back. And the enemy will be looking for that opportune time in your life as well. But keep in mind, this is not a sermon that's supposed to scare you in any way. You don't need to be afraid of any evil power. You see, Jesus, he doesn't get all flustered at the attacks of Satan. His demeanor seems to be so calm the entire time, doesn't it? Even whenever he's casting out demons later on throughout his ministry, he doesn't make it this big, long, drawn-out battle or make a big spectacle of it. He just says, get out. Be gone. Shoo. He didn't need to be afraid of any evil power because he was the highest power that there is. And if we're rolling with him, then we have absolutely nothing to fear because our lives are filled with the highest power that he is. 
Don't you forget that the same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you, believer. Don't forget that you've been adopted into his family, that you are royalty in the spiritual realm because you belong to him. Don't forget there's absolutely nothing that could ever separate you from his love, not your performance, not your mistakes, not any other people in this world, no dark influences. Nothing can separate you from the love of God because his love is more powerful than anything this world or any bit of darkness can ever throw at us. When those attacks come, make sure you know your Savior. Make sure you know his word and you know your identity in him and make sure your worship is directed towards him and nothing else. So why don't we stand to our feet and let's spend a few moments directing our worship towards him.